this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, not enough left to do, is there? Hello? Hey, don't worry about it. I'll fix it in a second. <laughs> he said he can fix it. <laughs> All right. All right. That's more like it. He says he can fix it. Good morning, Grace Walk. How's everybody this morning? I want to preach on being stuck. Ever felt stuck? But somebody else can see it's so simple, so simple how to get unstuck, right? But not if you're stuck. Here's a picture uh, I took off the internet of a lady pulling a sheep <clears throat> that had got stuck in, in the mar, in the, in the mud and, and the water. And it reminded me, because I've used this illustration several times about my mom. Um, uh, my mom and dad, my, uh, my dad's parents owned the cattle ranch, and, and uh, my mom and dad didn't live on the ranch. They lived off the ranch on this little farm, and they had sheep. And so the sheep, and we're sheep, right? That's what the Bible calls us, sheep. Okay, sheep do stupid things. So <clears throat> my mom used to get so frustrated with them, and I was asking her about that story again this morning, and she began to tell me uh, one instance where she got the sheep unstuck. Now, I'm probably anywhere from two to four years old at this time, and then... <clears throat> She had my two other brothers, uh, Pastor Joe and my brother Casey, or you, I refer to them as knuckleheads. But Anyhow, she's all by herself because my dad's nowhere to be found. And so she gets an idea. Now, you guys cannot use this idea because will you will get arrested for doing this. And so she takes me, my brothers, and she ties us to a fence... So she could go down, tie a rope to the sheep, and pull the sheep out, amen, to get the sheep unstuck. Gosh, today, if you even look at somebody, you might be going to jail wrong. Brenda told me, as I was telling her this story this morning, that her sister got so frustrated with her kids, she duct taped them to a chair. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. <clears throat> but we get stuck. Now, there's good things that can happen when you're stuck. There's bad things that can happen. I want to talk about our thoughts, and we want to get our thoughts unstuck so we can go somewhere in our life. <clears throat> These white uh, pointed things, they're barnacles. The barnacle is confronted with the decision about where it's going to live. Once it decides, it will spend the rest of its life with its head cemented to a rock. Now, your mind can hold unlimited thoughts, but if most of your thoughts are negative, if most of your thoughts <clears throat> uh, um, are worry, it kind of crowds out for other thoughts of being positive. So you've got to learn to control your thinking. And we can do that. The Bible gives us several scriptures on, on how to do it. But we got to make sure the right thoughts are stuck into our mind. And the thoughts that aren't stuck, we got to get 
that are wrong, we got to pull them out of our mind. Proverbs says, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So what you think begins to form who you are, your character, where you will go in life, what will hinder you, what will stop you, how, where, everything in a, every aspect of life. So it's important how we think. Your soul gets to tell your brain what to dwell on. Now, as I've preached on this before. I used uh, uh, Carolyn Leaf, who's a neuroscientist, and her thoughts on the brain and everything like that. But our thoughts take places in our brain. And <clears throat> that's why the Bible tells us, give no place to the devil. That's place means a beachhead, a place where he can land. So fear, whatever negativity that he brings into your mind, you've got to be able to take that out of your mind. But I want to focus on Philippians 4. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So, we pretty much know every one of these words. I mean, we don't have to get a strong concordance out and figure it out, right? And it's pretty simple stuff, unless you're stuck. And if you're stuck in your thinking many times, you're not meditating on, on pure thoughts, you're meditating on unpure thoughts. You're not, you're not thinking of, of things that are just, you're thinking of things that are unjust. Amen. Can anybody relate to that? You're who I'm preaching at. The rest, they're just liars. So that's something they got to overcome. So, noble. This morning on my way to church, uh, I'm on time. I like to, you know, I like to give myself margin. I like to be a little early. Pastor Joe, not so much. <clears throat> but when I, when I got here, just as I'm pulling up, I'm coming down 83rd Avenue, and right at Lower Buckeye, I'm just pulling up. The light's green. Uh, uh, there's um, a car coming down. I can see a white car coming down. There's a car in front of me, and then there's this... Uh, uh, white car, and all of a sudden, no, there's a red truck. So, all of a sudden, this red truck, even though that car's coming, turns right in front of him, and they they collide. And I'm thinking to myself, I need. I I see they're you know they've collided. I see they're moving around, and I think to myself, if I stay here and wait for the police officer. I'm going to miss this morning's service. So how many has heard of the story of the Good Samaritan? I was not the Good Samaritan. No, I was the priest that walked by. So I got my car. I drove up and drove around. I drove into the parking lot here, and I saw Makoto. And I go to Makoto. Makoto, go back to this accident. just happened. I give him the details of what happened. I said, tell the police officer, when the police officer come, you know, uh, uh, give him my information and everything. And I'm thinking, this is going to be a big ticket because I left the scene of, a, of an accident, right? So I didn't do the fully noble thing, but the conviction of God, <laughs> because I want to be right, okay? So... <clears throat> Makoto told me the officer just smiled and he said I wasn't going to get a ticket, so I'm standing on that. <laughs> what do you dwell on? Do you dwell on the good report or do you dwell on the anxiety, anxiety and fearful things? See, we're, we're in charge of our mind and our thoughts. 2 Corinthians says, cast down every cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What you dwell on, what you meditate on, 
is your choice. And you, you've got to take control of your life, and you've got to learn, and you, this is something that, that, that we have to practice at. It's not something, usually we have habits of wrong behavior or wrong thought lives. Now, this is a picture of uh, Jim Whitaker. He was the first uh, American to ca- climb uh, Mount Everest. See, we all have things in our life that we're climbing. They're all, we're trying to get over. We're trying to get past, right? So <clears throat> we need to conquer our own mountain. And, and if you're a worry wart, you need to conquer that. He, he, he hiked that mountain in 1963, and he made this statement and wrote a book called this. If you aren't living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. I thought I could hang out with that guy. You know, I like guys that kind of live on the edge. I, you know, I enjoy that, that uh, excitement. But sometimes it takes courage to get to that edge. Has anybody who's ever got a, climbed up anything and got stuck? I mean, you got up there, but it's the getting back down that can be a little treacherous. I remember... Joe Vasquez is here this morning. Uh, I climbed up on this roof. I don't even remember what I was doing up there. Anyhow, I'm up on the roof, and I go to get down, and I'm kind of hanging, but I cannot find the fence that I, and I'm, I'm kind of dangling there. And it was Joe Vasquez, as he was laughing at me, came out, grabbed my foot, and put it on, on the ledge. <laughs> Well, sometimes we need help, right? The Word of God is our help. He also said, you never conquer the mountain, you conquer yourself. And I thought that was so profound. I thought that was so powerful. You know, the Bible is helping us conquer ourselves. The Scriptures are for help us get through things. <clears throat> Philippians 4, 8 will help you get unstuck from your negative thoughts or whatever is plaguing you. 2 Corinthians teaches us that we have the power to bring our thoughts into captivity. We have the power, if a, the devil shoots a fiery dart or an evil thought into our mind, we have the power to take that thought and cast it out and put a righteous thought in there. But sometimes we come to places in our life, and I believe this is a picture of Jim. Uh, uh, It was, at least it was in the, next to the article. But sometimes, you know, now you see him walk across ladders, right? Which in, in itself would be a little bit hairy. But here he is, he's a mountain climber, and he comes to a, a place that looks like you can't get across. He goes back and he runs and jumps across. Amen. Sometimes we've got to make that leap. Sometimes we've got to jump across to get change in our life. Now, a great book I want to talk to you about is If How-Tos Were Enough, We'd All Be Skinny, Rich, and Happy. Buy the book. This guy... <clears throat> went on to do seminars. Several of the people in our, on our staff went to his seminars, and uh, uh, I never did. I just read his book. But I'm going to tell you, if you apply the truths you learn in this book, Brian has now passed away, it will help change your life because he, he breaks it down so you can figure it out. Uh, meaning has, is something you build into your life like we have meaning because we follow Jesus right? <clears throat> but one of his illustrations is how we have predetermined thoughts because we've been raised a certain way. We came out a certain culture. Uh, you ever hear somebody, this is, I hear this all the time uh, 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 from Roger. He says, this is what Mexicans do. I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you, Roger, I know a lot of Caucasian white people doing the same thing. But he uses an illustration about a scientist who is studying a sand wasp, and uh, the sand wasp would bring food to its hole, 
leave food at its hole, go inside to make sure there's no predators, no danger inside the hole, and <clears throat> he would get up and move the food. The wasp would come back out. It would see the food's moved. So it would go grab the food, drag it to the hole again, and go down to check the hole to make sure it was okay. How long would that go on? Well, they make the statement until the wasp would die of hunger because its predetermined thoughts make it act a certain way. We can overcome our predetermined thoughts. Here's his formula. Now, I'm giving you this formula. People pay thousands and thousands of dollars to go to his seminars. He's a multi-millionaire. I'll just take a lunch date from you. Okay? So you can, we'll start the list. If you're motivated, you'll find a way. But... You need to be intentional. How many here on Family Life Radio all the time? Be intentional, right? I mean, it's a constant flow. Well, Brian wrote this book many, many years before they capped that. But it's true. You have to be intentional. You want change in your life? You have to be intentional. You can't continue on. You have to grasp that thought. You have to replace it with a different thought so you can make changes in your life. So, intention. Determination to act a certain way. Purpose, aim, end. It's a focus, conviction, and commitment. Pictures, incidentally, are $100. <clears throat> Mechanism. A piece of machinery, a process, or technique for achieving a result, a vehicle. A way to accomplish something. So intention plus mechanism equals results. Result, something that happens, an effect or consequence of your action. Now, one of the illustrations he, he uses and teaches is your intent and your result are like your hand. You have a palm and you have the back. So whatever your intentions are always goes with you. You say, oh, I don't know if I fully buy that, Pastor. You don't know my circumstances. You don't know what's happened in my life. <clears throat> but what he also teaches is that your true intentions always come out. Like, for example, if I want to lose weight... We all want to lose weight, right? We're Americans. I know there's a few of you skinny people out there. For the majority of us, we want to lose weight. So we say, I want to lose weight. But it's not our true intention. What is our true intention? We want to eat. <laughs> Your intentions always equals results. So you intend that you want something to happen. We'd all like to double our salary, right? Right? Yes. But is it an idle wish, or are you really intentional about doubling your salary? Years ago, when, just after my wife died, I was carrying five mortgages, paying five mortgages on five different houses. It was a lot to carry for me. But I was intentional, and I said, you know what? I'm going to pay every one of these off. And so, and because I was intentional, I was willing to pay or commit to whatever it would take to get that done. And in a few years, I paid them off. But you have to be intentional. See, if it's not your true intention, it's more like an idle wish. It's not your deepest, most focused commitment. So if you want to change it, to get unstuck, then it's going to require action. There's always a cost. You want a better marriage? You've got to be intentional about your relationship. You've got to be intentional about that other person and what they need. You, you, you want to get in shape? You're going to have to go to the gym. I know some of you, that's a cuss word, and I'm sorry for cussing in church, but... 
<clears throat> you have to be intentional. You can't go for a month or one week or sign up for a year. You've got to go for a year. You, you're, it'll take minimum of three months, if not a year, to even for you to start seeing some results. You have your true intention can't be a wish list. Again, let's look at Philippians 4, verse 8 in the Common English Bible. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent, if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. That is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Practice these things. Whenever you learned or received, heard or saw in us, the God of peace will be with you. Focus your thoughts on the good, not the bad. And practice, 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 practice. Be intentional on what you do. So in a summary, <clears throat> what do you think on? True, noble, and pure, lovely, good reports, virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on that. Don't meditate on your problem. Don't meditate on what's not praiseworthy. Don't meditate on your problem. Meditate on the God who can solve your problem. So, what you drink, dwell on is brain science, according to Carolyn Leaf. Because it takes up in your brain. Your brain can't distinguish. It can't distinguish if you're a winner or a loser. But it will listen if you always put in, I'm a loser, I'm a loser, I'm a loser. If you want that particle stuck to your brain, keep saying that. If not, change your thoughts. I'm a winner. God can help me. I can do all things in Christ Jesus. If you want peace, then be intentional and dwell on it. Now, here's another uh, uh, mountain climber, uh, Ed Vister. He climbed a Mount Everest seven times. Now, he makes a key point here. He's also a, a motivational public speaker. He said, I've always understand getting off the mountain was more important than getting to the top. That's why he turned around his first two tries. And one time, he was only 300 feet from the top. Now, A, to get in shape to count Mount Everest is one thing. Another thing is there is a financial cost to doing it. They, they estimate today would be anywhere from thirty-five to $65,000 dollars to go there. So if you've paid $65,000 in your cloud in Mount Everett and you get within 300 feet, a lot of people press on through to their deaths. Average, average a year is five people die on the mountain every year because the, the weather changes or whatever uh, and, 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 and they're going to press through it. I've seen people who want to increase and make their life better by making more money and they're working hard. They're intentional on that. But they lose their marriage. They lose their marriage because their focus was, we're to put God first, right? Sometimes they start missing church, missing church, missing church. Second, we're to put who first? First is God, your spouse or your family. So you have to have priorities, and sometimes you're going to be almost there, but you need to take a few steps back and try again. You don't quit because you're intentional. So then he climbed it seven times. Now let's go to the disciples. <clears throat> now, hopefully you can read it because I can't. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, they called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. 
And he said unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Now, this is the beginning of Jesus calling his disciples to follow him. Right? So, <clears throat> Peter and Andrew make a commitment to follow Jesus. But before Peter and Andrew, before this ever happens, we find Andrew is a disciple of John the Baptist. He's with John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is doing, uh, he preaches on repentance, and he's doing a baptism of repentance, probably uh, 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 in the month of Luke, because that's when they, they do that. And, and so here he is. He's there. He sees Jesus. He sees the power of God on him. And he, and he says, this is the Messiah. And he leaves John, and, and, and he goes back, and he tells Peter, I have found the Messiah. I have seen the Messiah. So Andrew was, he was a spiritual person. He, he wanted to serve God. That's why he was with John the Baptist. And they're all looking for the Messiah. And Andrew recognizes the Messiah. So he goes, uh, uh, he, he's back with Peter. Jesus, we know, goes on into the wilderness and, and so forth. But somehow, somewhere, Jesus comes into Galilee. And <clears throat> the night before they're in this boat, uh, Peter's mother-in-law is sick. And Jesus comes in and heals Peter's mother-in-law. So they have this all working in, as, as you go through the book of Luke. This is all happening in their minds. Andrew already believes he's a Messiah. Now he's, he's seeing miracles by, by him. And uh, uh, Jesus comes to them. He wants to uh, give a message to the crowd. He wants to go in their boat. And uh, 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 the, Peter and, and uh, Andrew, they allow him in his boat. He preaches a message. Then he turns to Peter and he says, Peter, cast, go to the deep and cast out your net. Well, Peter had fished all night. I remember Bob Harrison giving me this truth many, many years ago. Why would you fish all night? Because the fish see your net. So, so, so he's a fisherman. He understands his trade. He had a bad day. He didn't catch anything. But to go back out after you're worn out and, 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 and throw your net in, I'm sure he might even roll his eyes. Just like some of you roll your eyes and you think, I can't change. This is who I am. I can't overcome this habit. But I'm telling you, you can overcome it. You can change. You can win in life. But you have to be willing to do what the Bible says. You have to take action. So what does Peter and Andrew do? They go back out. They cast down their net in the deep. They catch fish more than the net can help. They have to call for their partners to roll over and help them take all the fish they caught. And he learned another valuable lesson. Listen to the Lord. If he says it, he can do it. So <clears throat> Jesus comes to him. He says, follow me. Well, that's a rabbinic term that means you can be like me. So all of the Israelites, their schooling was learning the scriptures. And the very top of the class, <clears throat> every year, they would take a few out of that, the very top, the most intellectual people out of their class, and they would say, follow me to the next year, and you'll get another year of teaching. And every year it thinned down, thinned down, thinned down. But those that did not make it all the way up, the rabbi would say, go do your father's trade. This is what they're doing. This is why I, 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 I bring up James and John, the sons of Zebedee, because they're out in the boat. You know, after he, he, he tells uh, uh, Peter and Andrew to follow him, he goes to James and, <clears throat> and he says, you guys follow me. They leave their boat with their father, Zebedee, and their hired servants. That tells me they were extremely successful. They weren't broke. They were successful. But they saw something in Jesus that they wanted to be. 
And, and, and you know, I, 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 I put up on the screen, uh, after a lousy night of fishing, it seems like a no-brainer. What's the worst case scenario? Let's go back and be a fisherman, right? A blue collar trading in. I mean, if you work in the warehouse and you're offered to work up in the office in AC, it's a no-brainer, right? You're going to take that pay raise and, and take that jump. This change was easy for them. They were experiencing seeing miracles like they never thought and saw before. Their commitment, their intention to follow Jesus, they forsook everything and followed him. I believe in Luke chapter 9 is where they reached their summit. They reached the top of the mountain. I mean, they've been going up, 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 and then all of a sudden Jesus, uh, 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 it says in verse 9, or verse 1, it says, when Jesus had called the disciples together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bags, no bread, no money, no extra shirt, whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome, welcome you, leave their town and shake off the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from the village to village proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Their commitment had brought them to this place of life where they had faith. They were praying for people, and people were getting healed under them. People were getting set free from, from disease from them, from their anointing. Not with Jesus standing there. Not with Jesus' hand uh, praying for them. They themselves, and so they were at their summit. They were at the top of their mountain in faith. This is where we all want to be. So, uh, uh. Uh, the summary of chapter 9 is Jesus leads, sends out the 12. He feeds the 5,000. That was a picture I just showed with a couple of loaves of bread and fish. I mean, can you imagine how your faith is growing? Peter declares that Jesus is Messiah. Jesus predicts his death to them. They see the transfiguration. In other words, Jesus gets up to pray. He says, hey, uh, Peter, John, and, and, and James, won't you come with me? They go with him. That he's out praying, and, and uh, they see Moses and Elijah come down. And, they, uh, you know, I think it's Peter who says, hey, do you want us to build a tabernacle? And Jesus says, no. And then there's this cloud that forms. And they walk into this cloud, and they hear the voice of God, the Father. They hear Yahweh, and he speaks to them. This is my son. Listen to him. I mean, that's got to be pretty darn powerful. They literally were able to look into the kingdom of God. Then Jesus comes back. He heals a demon boy. Jesus preaches his uh, death a second time, and he talks about the cost of following him to other people that would like to follow him and what that is. Now, two times he tells them about their death, right? Here we read. He strictly warned them and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man will suffer many things but be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. So he predicts his death, but they don't hear him. They're living on the summit. That's where we all want to live. We want to live on the summit. They're positive. They, they can't even believe how... How could somebody kill God? I mean, they can't even get in. They can't hear. Even though the Father from heaven told them to hear my son's voice, and he tells them twice he's going to go to the cross, right? See, their commitment was strong during the good times. I see this in a lot of Christians because we preach on faith. We want people to live in this realm. We, we want people to have a positive faith. We, we want people to believe God for miracles. We want good things to happen in your life. We want to see you prosper. We, we, we want God to use your life. But you can get stuck in a theology that <clears throat> everything's good is going to happen. Now, 
We preach this all the time. I preach this all the time. But at times, you will go through difficult times in your life. There will be tragedies. There will be things happen. What happens then? Do you forsake? I mean, a lot of disciples forsook Jesus. At one time, he had 150. So, <clears throat> their idea, their theology, ideology got them stuck. So, when a bad thing happened to their life, when their marriage fell apart and it didn't get fixed by God, when one of their children died, they couldn't serve God. We find this when Jesus goes across. He gets arrested. He, right in the Garden of Gethsemane, they come in. They're arresting him. They're going to take him. This is right before he gets crucified. They wanted no part of the cross. Yet he had told them way back in Luke chapter 9, he said to them all, he's talking to his disciples, anyone who desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What profit a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his fathers and the holy angels. So, The disciples forsook Jesus. Mark says, day after day I was with you teaching in the temple, but you didn't arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. This is what he's telling as he's getting arrested. Then we read, and all his disciples left him and ran away. Because sometimes it's tough. Sometimes there are no answers why certain things happen in your life. They are tough, tough, tough times. But you've got to be, your true intention is, I'm going to serve God in the good or the bad. I'm going to live as much as I can on that that summit, on that mountain, and I'm going to be full of faith. I'm going to believe God. But sometimes your prayers are not going to be answered, and you will not understand why they not are answered. You may never understand. The disciples could not understand why Jesus was going to the cross. Now, we get it, but they're living at that time. We find Jesus comes back to them after he's resurrected, right? He visits them several times. He even has, <clears throat> uh, comes back a second, one time to Thomas, just so Thomas can physically touch him so he knows that he's real. Yet the disciples did not continue to do the will, the calling that God had asked them to do. What did they do? They went fishing again. See, true intentions will come out. Finally, the very last time Jesus goes to them, we pick up in in John. He, He said to them, he's talking to Peter right now. Peter, you know, he sees them out fishing. Uh, They don't know it's Jesus. Uh, 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 Peter uh, hears his voice. He says, do you have any fish? And, 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 And then he tells them to let their net down. They catch a bunch of fish. Peter knows it's Jesus again. This several times he's come back and saw him. What does he do? He takes his clothes off, jumps in the water, and swims to shore, right? Then Jesus is eating with them, and he says to Peter a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And what does Jesus say? Feed my sheep. Do my will. See, there's going to be times in your life where you're going to have tribulations. You're going to make a bad decision. Someone else is going to make a bad decision. You're going to go through some stuff. These things I've spoken to you 
so that in me you may have peace. The world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So you're going to have some tribulation in your life. Life is going to get hard at some times. You're not always going to be on the summit. There's sometimes you're going to have to deal with things and get through things and, and failures, your own failures, other people's failures. Take control of your thoughts because it will take courage to focus on good when you're in a bad place. It'll take courage to live for God and not quit serving God when you're in a very difficult place and keep walking with him. With that said, I'd like heads bowed, eyes closed in here. No one's looking around. If you're watching online, <clears throat> maybe this message was tailor-made to you. Maybe it was tailor-made to somebody you know. But I can tell you this, that we can overcome, but regardless of what goes on, we're in a, a very difficult period of time right now as far as the world's considered. I don't know what's going to happen. COVID keeps <clears throat> uh, changing. I, I don't know. We had more the worst fires uh, uh, the year before all through Australia. It didn't really affect us because we didn't know, but we're having some major. And it seems like we have this all the time, but the, something is going on, church. I don't know what's happened, but you've got to make up your mind to be committed through the good and the bad. And if you're willing to do that, I'm going to have you pray with me in a second. But before I do that, maybe you don't know about Jesus. You don't know who Jesus is. But you came today as an invite from somebody, or you just came on your own. You just felt to, uh, to come. I want you to know that Jesus wants to make himself real. Joining a church is not going to make Jesus real to you, but having a relationship will. And how you have a relationship with Jesus is simply by surrendering your life, praying a prayer of repentance, and giving your life to him. So while heads are bowed and eyes are closed in here, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Right now, lift your hand up real, very quick and put it back down. Lift it up and put it back down. Amen, 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 amen. If you're watching online, I want you to pray this prayer, <clears throat> and God is going to change your life. Say these words, Jesus, today. I, w hold on, hold on. I'm going to ask everybody in the church to pray this so we're not embarrassing people that for the first time are praying this. Jesus, today I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of all the sins, bad behavior I've committed. Change me. I choose to make you my Savior and my Lord by following your commandments. Thank you. Amen.